Okay, let's get started. Um, last week, uh, what we did, what we learned is the binary transmission. For example, like this, right? So we have S1 and S2. Those are symbols. So again, originally we start from bits, zero or one. But when you transmit, a after the modulation, bit zero and one will be converted to the symbols, S1 and S2. That's a part of modulation, right? So there are two modulation we learned, antipodal signals, antipodal signaling, and the other is a orthogonal signaling. So you can use one of these two. But anyway, eventually it'll be uh, converted to the S1 or S2. Those are symbols, right? So you transmit S1 or S2, right? That's what, what we transmit. And once you transmit S1 or S2, let's see a simple block diagram. We have a transmitter. And inside the transmitter, originally we, we transmit bits 0 or 1. And after the modulation inside, eventually we transmit S1 or S2. Maybe S1, S2 is going to be plus or minus. In that case, that's going to be antipodal signals. But you can, use, you can also use the orthogonal signals, right? In that case, these are orthogonal signals. You, can, you have two different choices. But anyway, you transmit S1 or S2. Those are symbols. Now, after you transmit symbols, we have, on the channel, we have a noise. We are thinking additive noise, right? Noise is added. And the noise we are talking always is AWGN, additive white Gaussian noise. So this noise is Gaussian. Its amplitude is Gaussian. So S1 and S2 is going to be constant. Maybe this is plus 1 or minus 1 if we use antipodal signaling. But plus 1 is transmitted, but noise has an amplitude Gaussian, so Gaussian is added. So as an example, let's say S1 is a transmitted and S1 is a plus 1, but in, in, on top of that, we have a noise is added, but noise is a Gaussian. right? Noise has amplitude Gaussian. For example, um, the mean is zero, but Gaussian is like this, right? So sometimes the noise is like a plus some value or minus some value that is added. So eventually, that is received at the receiver. And inside the receiver, that's, let's call that as R, and R is what we received, S plus N. That's what we received, right? So this is what we call as S1, S2. We put it together, we call that SM, right? Earlier, we called that as S sub M, right? Remember the S sub M plus N? So that is either S1 or S2. That's what we receive here. And inside the receiver, we learn the optimum receiver. And we learn the two different way of optimum receivers, right? Two, two, optimum, two different optimum receivers. One is a correlation based, the other is a match filter. But eventually, both are the same thing, right? Both are basically the same thing. So inside here, for example, we, we run the match filter. Something like that, right? And you're going to get the output after the optimum receiver. And the output here, we're going to check if this is plus 1 or minus. That's what we're going to check. Because in, in case of antipodal signaling, we are going to transmit plus or minus. So eventually at the receiver, we are, we are going to make a decision based on the plus or minus. Okay? That's the whole scenario. Right? So what is the error case? We are always interested in finding the error. So this graph, we call this one as a hypothesis. We even, we, Hypothesis. We call this one as hypothesis. Why do we call this hy binary hypothesis? What that basically means is from the transmitter point of view, we transmit S1 or S2. But receiver doesn't know which one is transmitted. So we receiver basically put, basically set a hypothesis that what is the probability that S1 is transmitted 
and what is the probability that S2 is transmitted? And we calculate those probability, two, dif two different probabilities, right? And find and pick the bigger probability. Pick the one with the bigger probability. That's going to be hypothesis. In this case, it's binary hypothesis. So every time when you look at the binary hypothesis, you're going to see this kind of um, two different Gaussian graph. And this graph shows you the probability of everything. Okay? This one is basically probability. Each one is a probability density function, right? We are drawing, what is this Gaussian? This is a probability density function. The left one is probability density function of receive symbol y. This is conditional probability, right? This is a probability density function of receive, receive sample y given that S2 is transmitted. Okay? Put it in other words, what this means is if, if, if S2 is transmitted, right, then we're going to receive some y, but that y will have this much of value with this probability. That's what they mean. Similarly, this one is the conditional probability, but simply speaking, what this means is this is a probability density function of receive sample y given S1 is transmitted. So that's why we set these two probability density function, put that together, and make this binary hypothesis. And based on this, what is mostly interested is that we are calculating this this area, the red one, blue one. So this shaded region will give us the probability error. We, we are not uh, interested in other area because in this other area, we receive successfully, okay? We are not interested in those things. We are interested in only the error probability. Okay, so that's what we are trying to calculate. It's pretty simple, actually. It's pretty simple. But let me tell you this one a little bit uh, different way. OK, so let me come back here. OK, let's look at here this one in a different angle. So we are thinking about noise, n. And again, this noise is a Gaussian noise with a zero mean, zero mean Gaussian. So let me draw this n this way. Here's a zero. So the, in this case, I'm just putting this way. Okay? This one is like this x-axis is the amplitude. But I'm drawing the amplitude onto the y-axis. Okay? Just rotate this picture 90 degree. Okay? Just 90 degree. This picture, what is this one? What is x in this case? It's a probability. Because what I'm drawing here is a probability density function. I'm just, this is a normal Gaussian, right? Here, zero. I'm just putting like 90 degree, rotate. That's what I have here, okay? So this y-axis here is the amplitude of noise. Sometimes noise will give us no, noise will have plus 0 0.5. Sometimes it can be minus 1.2, something like this, right? Noise always have some amplitude with random, something like this. This is noise, right? But what I'm drawing here is a time domain. So for example, at some point, you will have a plus 1.2, something here, right? Some other time, minus 0 0.7, maybe somewhere here. But you can count. When you have like a million samples, you can count how many samples you have plus 1.2 and how many samples you have a minus 0 0.37 and you can draw the probability. Then this is the probability. So from this text, what we can find out is when you put the million samples, maybe this much of probability, you get value zero. And that much probability you get minus, minus 1.2, something like this, right? 
that's what they mean as a probability density function. So this is the probability density function of our noise, n. Again, this is zero mean, because all this noise is going up and down, up and down, and mean is zero, right? So that's what we have. Let's take a look at r, r here. I'm, draw the, I'm going to draw the same way. So we have r. What is r? r is sm plus n. That's our r. So we have a 0 here. Now, suppose that s1 is plus 1, s2 is minus 1. Just the example. Okay. What we receive is going to be maybe s1, maybe s1 plus n or s2 plus n. We don't know which one is transmitted. But we know that maybe, maybe r is one of these two. So let's draw the s1 plus n first. What is sn? s1 is 1. And what is n? n looks like this. So what is going to be s1 plus n? s1 is just constant plus 1. So when you draw the s1 plus n, what's going to happen is this one is shifted by 1. So you're going to have this, right? This is s1 plus n, right? Same way you can draw the s2 plus n. s2 is minus 1. So the same way this is by shifted by minus 1 because we added minus 1 here. So of course, that looks like this, right? That's the picture we are talking about. This picture is that picture. This one is the same as that one. <coughs> I'm, just, I'm just drawing in a rotated, like, like a 90 degree rotate, but that picture is exactly the same as this picture. So what is this one then? This is the probability of R when S1 is transmitted. <coughs> okay? So this is the probability density function of R when S2 is transmitted. So that's this one. Same thing. I'm basically talking about the same thing. Okay? So receiver already knows this picture. We call this one as a hypothesis. We don't know. What that means is we don't know which one is transmitted. But we know that the probability picture. We know the whole picture. We know this probability density function. We know the hypothesis. Okay, so that's this one. So come back here. So in this hypothesis picture, again, what we are interested in is to calculate this area, because this area is going to be the error probability. Like you transmitted S1 actually, but because you, you have added noise, and noise maybe is like, unfortunately, noise at that time is minus 1.5. In that case, S1 is transmitted, but S1 is a plus 1. But noise is like a minus 1.5. So you end up receiving minus 0 0.5. Okay? So if you receive this, that's going to be error. Because your decision will be S2 at the receiver. Right? So that's an error probability. So some of those things, we have to calculate this area. That's the error probability. So that's our goal. That's what we are trying to do here. So when you look at here, right, this area, we can separate this area into two different things. One is the red shaded area. The other is a blue one. And red one is the case when actually S1 is transmitted, but you receive it as a S2. That's red one. Blue one is you actually transmitted S2, but you received as a S1. Okay, so it's a, that's the two different error cases. So come back here. This is the error probability when we get the threshold as alpha. This is alpha as a threshold. So let's call that as an error probability as a P2 and alpha. In this case, how to calculate this is that um, this one equals to, okay, I'll, I'll tell you about this one. We multiply some probability of S1 
and also some probability of S2. And this one basically tells you that how to calculate, so this one is a minus infinity to alpha, integrate minus, alpha, minus infinity to alpha, which means that, you know the Gaussian is always from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? So look at this picture. Look at this picture. From minus infinite to alpha. So here is alpha. Minus infinity is somewhere here. And you are going to calculate the, um, <coughs> the integral of this function. This one is uh, f y given s1. So this one. Right? So when you calculate the minus infinite to alpha, that's going to be this area. Because it's going to be minus infinite to alpha. And we are going to integrate this curve. So that's what we have, right? So this integration is going to be the red part. Same way, the second integration is from alpha to integral, uh, alpha to infinite. And this is fy given s2. So that's going to be the, this one. This, this PDF. And we are integrating from alpha to infinite. So this is alpha, alpha, alpha to infinite. So that is this one. <coughs> that integration is the, the right part, the blue, blue shaded region. And we are adding it, right? You are doing plus. That's how to calculate the error probability. Okay, so let me explain this one one more time in this picture, okay? So that is the official e the e equation, how to calculate the probability of error. But let me do the same thing in here. What we are trying to calculate is error probability. And in this picture, in this picture, what is the error probability? Here is the error probability. Here, right? Here's error probability. And again, when you look at this error probability, there are two regions, right? In this case, there are two regions. I'm going to use 0 as a threshold. In that case, I use alpha as threshold. But let's use 0 in this case. One region is this one. Another region is this. We have uh, two different regions. OK? So let me call um, the, this region as 1. This region is 2. Eventually, what, what I'm trying to do is that my error probability Let's, let me call this a PE, is going to be 1 plus 2. That's my error probability. 1 is this part, 2 is the upper part. And you know, 1 is the case, this is the case where actually, you look at the 1. This is still below this curve, right, this PDF. So that PDF is this one. So actually, S1 is transmitted. But uh, S1 is actually transmitted, but you receive it as S2. That's the case one. And case <coughs> two is going to be S2 is transmitted, but you receive it as S1. So that's why we have an error, bit error. Right? Look at S2. S2 is still this curve. And this curve is receive sample given that S2 is transmitted. So actually S2 is transmitted, but Unfortunately, because of a very large amplitude of noise, you receive it as, the, you receive it as a, a positive value. S2 is negative, so you, you actually transmit negative value, minus 1. But noise is like a plus 2, so you receive it as plus value, so you detect it as S1. So that's the error case. So we have two different error cases, and we are basically adding these two probability to calculate the error probability. So that's what we are trying to do. Now the question is, how do you calculate 1? And how do you calculate 2? That is a question. Okay, that's a question. So to do that, what we are trying to do is we are going to Q function. We learned the Q function last time, right? Let's take a look at the Q function first. Let's take a look at only the Gaussian. This is a standard Gaussian. Standard Gaussian means that this is Gaussian with zero mean and variance one. That means a standard Gaussian. When you have this standard Gaussian, 
let's say you want to calculate this area and the, the, this threshold is alpha and you want to calculate the alpha and higher. Simply speaking, what is the Gaussian PDF? Let's say, let's say Gaussian. Let's call that as X. What is the Gaussian PDF? Standard Gaussian. Gaussian. Standard Gaussian PDF is this. Right? This is a, a Gaussian PDF. This is a PDF of Gauss, standard Gaussian. Which means this graph is this. Mathematically, this graph is this. And what we are trying to do is integrate from alpha and higher. So how do you do that? Simply alpha to infinite <coughs> fx dx. That's what we are trying to do, simply. That's this one. That's this one. Now the problem is that when you try to put this inside the integral, and you are actually calculating integral equation, this integral is not simple to do. It's not simple to do, right? It's very difficult to do. So you need to run the computer to calculate this. You cannot do by hand. So that's a problem. So because of that, what people, this, but we see this one very, very often. This is very common, but this is calculate, uh, the, difficult to calculate. That's why the people decided that, oh, uh, rather than doing writing this way every time, it's integral, right? Looks, it's, it, it doesn't look good. So why not just make it simple as a Q alpha? Okay, let's call this one as a Q alpha. That looks like a simpler than this one, right? This one doesn't look simple, but this one looks simple. So that's why people just agreed that, okay, let's call this case as a Q alpha. So that's why we have a Q function mm -hmm. like this. So this is the official definition of Q, <coughs> Q function. So we're gonna get, get, we're gonna call this a Q function. And from now and on, every time you want to calculate this kind of thing, you are not doing calculation. Instead, you can just simply say Q alpha, that's it. So your answer is not, if you actually calculate in com by computer, maybe the value is something, something like this, right? But you are not gonna calculate. Your answer is gonna be Q alpha. That's your answer, that's it. You don't calculate, okay? This actual calculation can be done in computer, so you don't have to do it, okay? What you need to do is, this is gonna be your final answer. Q something, Q alpha, that's your final answer. So that's uh, the definition of Q function. However, every time when you see the Gaussian, we are most likely we see this kind of Gaussian. This case is a standard Gaussian, variance one, but you may see the variance different value. In this case, we have different variance and not over two. So what if we have a different variance? In that case, we can use uh, some high school mathematics technique, like a change of variables, and basically put it together, and you can change it variable. And um, in this case, if you, if you have a different variance, variance comes here, right? And variance comes here, you know that, right? That's a Gaussian. So using, to, using that one and put it in, inside here, and change your variable, putting all together, then eventually you're gonna get this value. So it's, when you take alpha, this is alpha. It's basically the same thing. So this is the uh, variance. This is the equation for this Gaussian distribution. When you have a different variance, that variance go inside here, right? Go, go in here. So eventually, uh, you're gonna get this PDF. If you use this PDF and doing integration from alpha to infinite, you're gonna get this Q function. So this Q function, this Q function is the same, actually. Same, right? Oh, you see the Q, Q alpha. Only the difference is that this one is a not standard Gaussian. This one is a different variance. Because of that, you have this term inside the Q function. But eventually those two are same thing. Okay, same thing. 
So that's how to calculate the uh, these area. So given that, now let's come back here. What we are trying to do is, again, we are trying to calculate this area, number one, and this area, number two. Okay? And we're going to add it together. So let's separate them together. I'm going to draw the one here. One, basically, is that... Oh, no. So this area one is basically this area. That is one. Two is this area. That's two. Right? That is two. I'm just separate them together, right? So one is this area, two is this area. So this one, the one, let me draw it horizontally. This is one. Okay? This picture and this picture same, right? Same. So this is what we are calculating. So how do you calculate this? Using Q function. That's why I that's why I introduced the Q function, right? So this one is gonna be Q function. What about two? Two. If I draw it uh, horizontally, the Q the two is gonna be this. Ah uh, no. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. This is threshold is zero, right? Yes, it's zero. This is also zero. This is zero. The mean is plus one. Zero. Yeah. So this is two. Okay? This is one. Ah, this is one. This is two. That's what we are gonna calculate. So simply speaking, this is gonna be just Q function. That's exactly the same as this, right? Only difference is that this picture, the middle point, the mean is going to be plus one. No, actually minus one. Uh, this one, right? So plus one. Here's the plus one, right? Here's plus one. OK, so I'm just. Uh, so here's plus one, but okay, let me okay, let me call it this way. I'm just putting this one as up. This one is higher. So maybe I can pick as this one is a two. Minus one, zero. We can call this one as a one. Zero. This is plus one. Basically the same thing, but since I put up as a higher value. You know, when I put it together as a horizontal way, then I think this one is uh, easier to understand. So let me draw the one. Uh, let me put the two first. Two is this one, right? But here's a minus one. Minus one is the middle point. So we have a minus one. And the threshold is a zero. And what you are integrating is the higher value than zero. Like this, right? That's two. Same way if you look at one horizontally, then one is this area. So threshold is zero, same way. And the middle point, the mean is a plus one. Mean is plus one. And what you are integrating is the area below zero. So negative, like this. So this is one, this is two. So this two is very simple because that looks exactly the same as this Q function, right? Only difference is that original Q function always has a mean zero. But in this case, the mean is minus one. But does it matter? That doesn't matter. Why? Because whatever value you have doesn't matter. What we are calculating is this area. So what we can do in this case? We can just simply change it to zero and one. Doesn't matter, right? Because this area does not change. That's what we are calculating. This value doesn't matter. The original value is minus 1, 0, 
But as long as the difference between these two is 0 and 1, nothing changes. This area never changes. So we can just change it. Once you do that, this becomes 0, this becomes 1. Now we have exactly the same picture as this. Only difference is <coughs> this one is F. Uh, we are looking at this is 2. So this is 2. We are looking at this one, F R S 2. <coughs> so this is a PDF, and we know that this PDF is a Gaussian with a zero mean and variance this. How do you know the variance is this? That is a given here. This is again uh, the, very, the PDF of noise, right? And we are going to assume this noise is Gaussian with the variance n0 over 2. So we're going to have the same Gaussian, same variance. So once you assume that, now that picture is the same as this, exactly the same as this. Exactly the same, right? Because even variance is the same. Only difference is that this is a 1. The threshold is 1. Here, the threshold is alpha. That's only difference. So now, what is going to be this value? This area? <coughs> it's going to be the 2. This area 2 is going to be? We, we already have the answer here. When you, when you find out this area, you do calculation, integration, and eventually our answer is this. We know that, right? Our answer. So we, we just get that answer and use that. <coughs> That's our answer. So this is going to be area 2. You're not going to ca calculate any further. This is your answer for 2. Okay? Just, you, you just want to use this one. Okay? What about 1? How do you calculate this 1? How do you calculate it? Every time when you see the Gaussian, uh, every time when you calculate the Q function, it's always going to be a sum threshold and right side. Sum threshold and right. That's the area we are calculating. How do you calculate this left? Left area, left side of the threshold. <coughs> Again, what we are calculating is this area. As long as this area is the same, okay, we can do everything. What we can do is we can just flip it, left and right. Put the meter here and just flip it. And the difference, the distance between zero threshold and the middle point is one. So again, the same way, what we can do is, we can do it this way. Nothing changes, right? Because we are calculating this area, this area is the same, exactly the same as this area. This one and this one the, is the same. In terms of this area, it's the same. Exactly the same, right? So when you have left, you can just flip it and put it into the right. And as long as you have maintained the same distance, same distance, nothing changes. And what is this area? This area actually is the same as this. Both are same. So what is going to be our answer? Our final answer is going to be 1 plus 2. And, and 1 and 2 are same. So what is going to be our final answer? 2 times Q function. That's your answer, final answer. So every time you see a, let's say, midterm, final exam, or any, any, any other places, when you get a question like, calculate uh, average probability of error, let's say you are asked to calculate this area, your answer is going to be like Q function. You're not going to calculate this one further. Okay? That's going to be your answer. So this is a simple example, example, right? I'm just uh, uh, the example in the sense that I use the plus one and minus one, and also um, 
I use this variance, so that's example. And also I said that I put the threshold as a zero. So that's why I'm, I'm saying this is the example. But this example is the simplest example. But this picture here, uh, the equation in this slide is a little bit generalized scenario, a little bit general. So let me explain this, uh, this slide. Again, this equation and this equation, this is the integral from minus infinite to alpha, minus infinite to alpha of this PDF, this PDF. So this is going to be the red area, that's for sure. And this integral is going to be for blue part, that's for sure. So which means that this area, this integration eventually comes to the Q function. This area is, this integration again is going to be another Q function. Okay, both are going to be Q function. Now the question is, why do we have this probability? Why do we have this probability? So this is the probability of S1. Simply, this is the probability of S2. What does that mean? Probability of S1 and probability of S2. What does it mean? Here is what that means. Let's take a look at from the transmitter point of view. Okay? From the transmitter point of view, we have uh, two choices. You can transmit S1 or S2. Okay? You can, every time, right? Every time you can transmit S1 or S2. Uh, now the question is, how many times do you transmit S1? And how many times do you transmit S2? That's the question. Maybe in, <coughs> in some cases, maybe you transmit 90% of the time you transmit S1. And only 10% of the time you can transmit S2. That's possible, right? But most likely, in general, we assume that it's like a 50%, 50%. That's the common assumption, right? We transmit S1 and S2 like a 50-50, half and half. That's a common assumption, right? Always. So every, if you assume this, like half of the time you transmit S1 and the other half of the time S2, like a 50-50, in that case, uh, this, is, this probability is half. And this is the half. So PS1, is this one or this one. So what is the probability that you transmit S1? And what is the probability that you transmit S2? Okay, that's the PS1 and S2. So this case, like you transmit S1 for 90% of the time, PS1 is gonna be nine divided by 10, right? PS2 is gonna be only one over 10. And this case, PS1 and PS2 both are same as a half. Okay, so this is a common assumption, but in general, this is also possible. Maybe some, someone wants to do it this way for some reason. That's also possible, right? But this is more common. So that is the probability. Why do we need this? Uh, in this picture, when you look at this hypothesis, Gaussian graph, PS1 and PS2 is not in this picture. Because this picture is like, if you transmit S1, we have these kind of received samples. And if the S2 is transmitted, we have this. So PS1 and S2 is not in this picture. But let me come back to basic probability, uh, probability theory. Let's say, just forget, forget these things, okay? Just come back to the basic of probability theory. Let's say you want to calculate the probability of R. How do you change it into con conditional probability? 
let's say, this one. And you need to multiply some more things, right? What do you, prob what do you multiply? Here, you, prob you multiply this, right? So this one is the same, actually. Why is that? Probability of R equals to the equals to the probability R given R1 and the multiply by probability of R1, S1 and probability of S1. So this is the same, right? Just, just using conditional probability. That's what we are doing here. Similarly, here, what we are drawing here is the conditional probability. Conditional, right? This is also conditional. So that's why you multiply S1 here, S2 here. That's why you're going to get eventually the error probability. Um, or maybe you can think about this way. Uh, let's say you transmit S1 90% of the time, S2 only 10%, which means that this one 90% of the time, right? This one only 10%. Let's compare the 1 and 2. 1 is the case when you have a tr S1. 1 is the case you transmit S1, but you receive S2. And 2 is the S2 is transmitted, S1 is uh, received. But now think about that S1 and S2 is like 90%, 10%. Which one is more common? Which one happens more common, more frequently? Simply, S1 is uh, transmitted 90% of the time. So of course, this one happens more often, right? Because S1 is more transmitted. Which means that, one, this area happens more often. S2 is transmitted only 10% of the time. Maybe, maybe a little bit, some cases, when S2 is transmitted, we receive S1, but that does not happen, happen very often because S2 is not transmitted often, anyway. So one is more common. In that case, what is gonna be the probability of error? How do you calculate probability of error? This is more common. This happens much, much more common. Two does not happen. Doesn't happen often, right? In that case, now the question is, do you still wanna use zero as the threshold? That's the question. In the earlier case, the reason I use a zero as a threshold is because that I'm assuming half and half. Okay? So S1 and S2 is transmitted like 50%. So that's why the middle point is, of course, the optimal threshold. But if the 90%, 10% is used, this happens much, much more often. This one only once in a while. So you don't want to use zero as a threshold. Okay. Then which one do you want to use? Where is the threshold? Best, the optimal threshold. This one happens more often. This one happens less, less often. So do you want to make it less than zero or higher than zero? This one happens more often. Now the problem is, think about this way. This is the error probability. So we want to make it as small as possible because this is the error probability, right? This one happens much more often. So would you want to put the threshold lower or higher? Lower. You need to want to lower like that, right? Lower. Why? Because this area happens much more often. So you want to make it as smaller because this one happens much, much more often. Make it small. When you do that, the, the other area is getting a little bit bigger, but that's okay. That, that does not happen often anyway. So that's why this threshold is not going to be zero in that case. In, in this case, the threshold is different. That's why in this picture, I put it as alpha. Okay? This alpha is a function of a PS1, PS2. PS1 and a PS2. It's not always zero because of that, right? So as a special case, if, if PS1 and PS2 both are half, if, right, that's this case, 50% S1, 50% S2. In that case, alpha is going to be zero, like a simple. 
But this one is a special case. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about uh, that just a general case in the next slide. But anyway, if the, these are same, like 50%, 50%, right? Then we have a half here because PS1 is a half. So put that half here. PS2 is also half. So put that half here. And each one is, a, again, is a Q function. But half and half, and this right area actually, here's also alpha here. Here's alpha, also alpha. And this alpha is zero anyway. So put zero here. Put zero here. When you do that, right, this one and this one become same. That's what I have here, right? Earlier, I assuming half and half. That's why the threshold was a zero. I was using, I was using zero, right? And it turns out that I use a zero, and also I use a zero. So this one, you can flip it and calculate. Eventually, this two and one become same. This one and this one become same. This one, this one it becomes half and half. So eventually, it becomes one Q function. That's what we have here, right? Eventually, as you see here, eventually it's going to be one Q function. So what I'm talking about here and here is the same thing. Okay, same thing. Okay, I'm talking about the same thing again and again. But this one is a little bit general equation. What I'm talking about here is an example. But same thing, basically. Eventually, we have only one Q function. But this is true only when you have half and half. Only half and half, right? Then it's simple like this. In the next slide, now then, uh, it's this Q function. OK, now then, uh, OK. Uh, okay, then let's go to the next slide. Okay, now then, what if we have a different PS1 and PS2? So that's this case. We are, gonna, we are going to come back to the previous equation. This is a previous equation. We have one Q function here, another Q function here. This Q function, Let's put that as alpha as a threshold. This particular case, right? This is the case uh, with the minus infinity to zero. So that's going to be two in that picture. This integration is going to be alpha to uh, infinite. Oh, no. This is one, actually, right? Minus infinity. Yeah, this is one. This is two. Right? 2 is going to be 0 to infinite. That's going to be PS2. Yeah, so this is 2 in that picture, right? So we know that this area 1 and area 2 is going to be Q function anyway. But as I said earlier, each one is multiplied the PS1 and PS2. Because this is a function of S1. So you need to multiply PS1. So this PS1, this PS2, will put some weight. Maybe you can think about that. Weight. Why do you want to put the weight? Because in this case, the P1 is, S1 is transmitted 90% of the time. So more important, right? It's more common, so more important. S2 is transmitted only 10%. Less important. So that, that's why you need to multiply like weight. In that case, the PS1 is 90%. So you want to put the 0 0.9 here. In this case, only 10%, so you multiply 0 0.1. So think about that way, put the weight. So anyway, you need to multiply it this way. So what we are trying to talk about here is that if the PS1 and PS2 is not the same, in the previous slide, you, we saw that half and half. So that was the case of same PS1 and PS2. But if this PS1 and PS2 is not same, then what we are need to do, what we're trying to do here is that what we are trying to do is we are trying to find the alpha. That's what we are doing here. How, to, how do you find the alpha? We want to find the optimum alpha, the best alpha. Okay, that's what we are trying to do. So every time when you try to find the best solution or optimum solution 
or minimum solution, what do you want to do? That's what we call as optimization in general. So when you have, when you come to some goal, okay, I want to minimize something, I want to maximize something, I want to find the optimum value, okay? Some of those questions, what you need to do is that the common way to do it is you want to take a derivative. Some, something like this, right? You know, going, going back to the high school, high school mathematics. Let's say you have some quadratic function like this. How do you find the maximum? Let's say this is fx, some quadratic function, or some, some square, something like this, right? How do you find the maximum value? You're gonna put, huh? you're gonna put the derivative, right? Right, and then put it as a zero. Then you're gonna get the best x, and put this x here, you're gonna get the best answer, right? So that's the easiest way to find the maximum or, or optimum value. You're gonna do the same way here. So this is the original equation. Now we are gonna take a derivative. This integration, this is integration, when you put the derivative, the inside thing comes out, just simply comes out. This one just comes out. And you see that this is plus and this becomes minus. The reason is that this one now, we're gonna flip, we're gonna flip the region, integration region. Maybe you can flip this one or this one, doesn't matter. But why do we need to flip? Because we want to make the same, right? This one is from minus infinite to alpha, this one is alpha to infinite, so maybe this one you're gonna flip it and make it as alpha to infinite, minus alpha to infinite, same way. Then take an integration. There's a way, there's a technique how to do this. This is called the Leibniz rule, whatever it means, Leibniz. If you want, you can search on the Google, Leibniz rule. Okay, there's a rule like that, but anyway, so taking the Leibniz rule and put the derivative of this integration function, eventually you're gonna get this simple equation like this and put it as a zero to find the alpha, optimal alpha. Then we, we have a very simple equation. So rearrange them, we're gonna get this answer. This right here, f alpha um, given S1, this is Gaussian. This one is also Gaussian. So we know the Gaussian equation, right? So put this Gaussian equation here, like for example, uh, this, is, uh, this is a case we have mean zero and various n naught over two. So what was our, for example, f y s one? What is the, our uh, equation? We know that our Gaussian equation is like this, right? And also when you have S2, you're gonna change the mean as S2. So put, put that equation here and here, and both are, this one and this one, both are Gaussian, both one has the same constant, so this constant will cancel out so you, you're gonna cancel out the constant. Uh, then here is like exponential minus something divided by another exponential minus something. But when you flip this up and then make a plus and multiply it, right? So that's what we have here. So this part is actually, this part is actually same as this. And the right part is still the same as a p s2 divided by p s1. Again, what we are trying to find out is alpha. And this is exponential. So put that together, right? This is a multiplication of two exponential. So that's gonna be the addition of two power exponents, right? This one and this one plus. And make it as one exponential. And once you make one exponential like this, put them together, right? You can make this. Now you can take a log, right? You can take a logarithm. Once you do that, because alpha is on the power exponent, so you can take a log, alpha, bring the alpha out, eventually you're gonna get this answer. 
So that is the general answer, the most general answer of our threshold. So let's put the uh, example here. Let's say our PS1 and PS2 is the same, like what we did earlier, right? We, we earlier, we assumed uh, half and half, right? If these two are same, you know that this part becomes one. Log one is zero. So eventually alpha is zero in that case. But what about 90% and 10%? In that case, we put, which one is 90? S1 is 90%, right? So this one is going to be 0 0.1. This one is going to be 0 0.9. So you're going to have 1 over 9 and log. And this value is already known, constant value. So multiply that. Then you're going to get some value of alpha. That alpha is going to be your optimum alpha. But in this case, it's going to be positive or negative? This is negative, right? So we know that uh, this alpha needs to be low or negative, okay? as I said earlier. And that one you can also vi look, at also, uh, look at in this picture, right? Since this one happens much, much more common, you want to make it smaller, right? That's right. So this is how to calculate the alpha, optimum threshold alpha. <coughs> the equation looks like a messy, looks a little bit difficult, but it's, it's not that difficult to understand. Okay. That's how to calculate the optimum alpha. Okay. Now come, oops. Now come back to the previous slide. Okay, here in this picture, I want to talk about one more thing. In this binary hypothesis, this picture, okay, we are still in this picture, right? In this picture, we, we, what we just looked at is how to calculate the best alpha, okay? How to calculate the optimum alpha. And what do you mean by optimum in this case? Minimize, minimize the bit error rate, okay? What we want to do is that we want to minimize the bit error rate. Let me, let me write it here. Minimize. We want to minimize bit error probability. Probability. Bit error probability. Okay? We want to minimize bit error probability. That's what we want to do. And based on this alpha, if you change the alpha, bit error probability changes. Right? If you use a different alpha, our bit error rate change. Bit error probability changes. So what is the best alpha or the optimum alpha that gives me the minimum bit error rate, bit error probability? Okay, that's, the, that's what we are talking about. And the best alpha to get the minimum bit error rate is, is what, we, what we looked at uh, in the next slide. Okay? That is this one, this one. So this alpha gives me the minimum bit error rate bit error probability. I'm, I'm just keep saying bit error rate, but bit error rate is the same as bit error probability. Okay? So this one gives me the minimum bit error probability. So let's come back here, the previous slide. So that's what we discussed so far. The alpha is selected that way. There's one more important thing in this picture. Alpha is selected as the best solution. But the, the one more important thing is the distance between these two. Distance. Okay, let's think about why this is important. Again, this is a, a binary hypothesis. S1 is transmitted or S2 is transmitted. But let's say, and, and our S1, S2 is like a plus one and minus one, right? Now let's think about this way. Here is a plus one, and here is a minus one. That's what we have here as an example. Now, what about I use S, S1 is plus two, and S1, uh, S1 is plus two, S2 is minus two. In the previous case, I use S plus one and minus one, but now I want to use plus two and minus two. Which one is better? 
assuming that noise is same, okay, I'm assuming noise is same noise, same statistics, okay, what I'm changing is only S1 and S2. That's only changed. Which one is going to be better? S plus 1, minus 1, or plus 2, minus 2? Why the plus 2 and minus 2 is better? That's because D is going to be <coughs> bigger. Okay, I'll tell you why that, that's important. Let's say here is a minus, plus 1, minus 1. Here is a plus 2, here is minus 2. If you use plus 1 and minus 1 and go through the whole process of this transmit receiver, now we are going to get this picture, right? And based on this picture, or based on this high binary hypothesis, we can calculate how much we have this error. Now, instead, let's say we use plus 2 and minus 2. In that case, when you draw this hypothesis picture, now the mean becomes plus 2, and mean becomes minus 2. So your Gaussian graph is going to be this, and this, over oh, here, and this. So we, I have a mean minus 2, and the mean value plus 2. This is the case when you have, this is the probability density of received sample given that S1 is transmitted. Same way, okay, same way. Definition is same. This is the probability of received sample given that S2 is transmitted. So everything else is same. Only difference is that now these two Gaussian is further away. Okay? Because we have uh, plus 2, minus 2, so those are further away. Now what you can notice is that if you make these two Gaussian further away, meaning that this distance, S1 and S2, this distance is getting larger, now think about the overlap. This overlap is going to be very, very small. So when you make these two distances bigger and bigger, this area becomes smaller and smaller. That's good for us, right? Because we are interested in the error probability. Smaller is always better. Smaller error probability means better. That's very easy to understand, right? Let's see, let's see that instead of plus 1 and minus 1, let me transmit plus 2 and minus 2 and go the same thing. Then instead of this, now we have plus 2 here and minus 2 here. So mean is here and our error probability is much smaller. And let's say you transmit plus 2 minus 2 at the receiver, it's much easier to separate, right? Much easier to separate. Let's say you use plus 5, minus 5, it's even easier. It's much easier, right? Yeah, so that's, that's what we have here. So when you have a larger distance, generally, um, error probability is reduced. But how do you know? Let's take a look at in this example. This is an example when I use the plus 1 and minus 1. If I use the plus 2 and minus 2, what, was the, what would be the answer? Here it becomes 2, right? Because I use the 1 here because this one was 1. But if I use the plus, one and minus, plus 2 and minus 2, I would, ha I would have get this answer. So when you look at this Q function, let's say when you compare Q1, Q2, which one has a smaller value? Let's compare these two. Which one is bigger, which one is smaller? Remember, the Q definition of Q function is like this, this area. Right? So Q1 means that 1, this area. Q2 means 2, that area. So definitely, this one is much smaller, much smaller. Okay? Based on the original Q function, this one is much, much smaller. So when you increase the value, to plus two, 2, minus 2, this becomes much smaller. Inside the Q parameter, parameter inside the Q becomes larger. That means the whole probability is smaller. Okay? Uh, OK. 
Okay. Okay, so let's continue next next week.